I want to welcome you to our Q&A session with the Pastors Johns. How do you pluralize that? Pastor uh, Johns. That, that's good enough. Pastors Johns. There is something wonderful about this opportunity. Both of these men are known for their uh, deep well of biblical and theological knowledge. Their years and years of pastoral faithfulness uh, have prepared them for moments like these. Uh, they both have a burden to answer people's questions. Dr. MacArthur, you have had hundreds of sessions with your local church uh, where you'll just open up the microphone on Sunday night and ask and answer people's questions and they'll line up. And it was, I think two weeks ago, you answered questions for two hours, uh, extemporaneous, just what was on people's hearts. Uh, Pastor John uh, Piper, also uh, a, we're gonna do Dr. MacArthur, Dr. Piper, just to fix this problem. Dr. Piper, you have a, a podcast called Ask Pastor John. Do you listen to that? It's incredibly helpful as uh, the dear Tony Renke asks you so many questions, and I want to tell the guys right away that that podcast uh, has produced a book of 750 Bible answers to life's most important questions. Uh, so ask Pastor John. It's totally sold out in the book tent already. So it just disappeared quickly. Uh, you, can, you can get it online. So I recommend that to you men. And obviously, Dr. MacArthur's years and years of answers to Bible questions are at gty.org. And I think that's where I'd like to start is, why is it so important for the pastor to, to be accessible, to ask and answer questions, to be there for people's needs? And it, why, why has that become such an important part of your ministries? Dr. MacArthur, start with you. <clears throat> well, because you, you don't want to spend your whole ministry telling people what they don't want to know. Sometimes we do, yeah. Yes. <laughs> but I said you don't want to spend your whole ministry. <laughs> you want to spend some of your ministry telling them what they don't Touché. want to know. But, but you also want to spend a lot of your ministry telling them what they desperately want to know, the cries of their heart, the dilemmas that they face, and particularly in a pastoral role where there's trust. So you, you don't have to sort of um, give an uh, apologia for every answer you give because you've built in trust by feeding them the Word of God. And I think... I think you know, Paul set me on that course when he dialogued Dialego. I talked back and forth with the people he ministered to to answer their compelling questions. And for him, it would have been more difficult because all they would have had at most would be the Old Testament. For us, we can direct them to the New Testament, but this has always been a vital part of our ministry. Uh, and I think what I hear from deconstruction people the ex-evangelical hashtag people, is that they went to a church, but they never got their questions answered. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for that. We, we have the answers. Yeah. So it's about, it's about the contemporaneity of those questions. It's what's on people's hearts. It's also about the sufficiency of Scripture. What's the burden behind your desire to answer people's questions, yeah. Dr. Piper? Yeah. Well, at my stage in life, when I'm, I don't have a, a local church anymore that I oversee as the pastor, um, look at the book, which is the other little thing I do online, has kind of replaced my preaching role and as Pastor John has replaced my counseling role. <laughs> so I get to do all my pastoral work online. Um, that's one way to look at it. Uh, the other is, um, the pulpit, John MacArthur and John Piper, I think is not exactly the same as the yeah. Q&A, John Piper, John MacArthur, yeah. or the conversational John MacArthur. At least that's, that's what people tell me about you, and I think that's what I've found. They, they say you're a bulldog in the pulpit. <laughs> and, and then they say, you're the, they say you're the kindest, gentlest, most gracious person in conversation. 
And I've, I've seen both of those. Now, I, I have no idea whether I'm viewed as a bulldog or a kind person, but I think I am viewed as a different person. So I think that your, your flock n needs to know you yeah. both ways. It, it, is, it is not a bad thing to be a prophetic authority in the pulpit that, that scares the heebie-jeebies out of people. <laughs> and, and it's not a bad thing to, to be a, a, a lowly servant, quiet listener who gets your arms around people out of the pulpit. Yeah, you, you preach with boldness and you give an answer with meekness and fear. Yeah. So we've highlighted before in Q and A's with the two of you, how different you both are. Different personalities wired in different ways. And I think that's you know, something that we thank God for in the way he makes people different. But there's something that has been noticed at this conference and it's that you two have an unusual bond. Uh, people are taking pictures of you two greeting and hugging each other and uh, talking together and posting them online and just talking about how encouraged they are by the bond and friendship that the two of you share. Uh, I really want this Q&A to be helpful to these pastors that are, are watching and listening to this. And I think that there's, there's something that you could teach us about why relationships with another pastor are so important. Mm -hmm. well, what is it about friendship that will enhance a man's pastoral ministry? And we've heard a little bit about that in this conference, but speak experientially to these brothers and help them think about the pastor and friendship. Mm -hmm. I've heard people say that uh, your, your best friends are gonna have to be outside the church not your own church, not your own staff, not your own elders, deacons. I, don't, I did not find that true, and I don't think it's a healthy thing to talk that way. Uh, I, for 33 years, considered my staff my best friends, and the elders were absolutely trustworthy with my life. So if Noel and I were having problems I didn't try to hide it from anybody on the staff. They were my closest friends. Uh, it, they are still today <laughs> the ones that I still have around, around me. So that's the first thing I'd say is don't, don't feel like, oh, you can't have a good friend inside the church because you can't really be honest with them. But baloney, you, you really ought to be honest with the people closest to you and, and work with you. Um, we need to know each other through and through. You know, for whatever reason, Jesus had his Peter, James, and John, and he had his 12, and he had his 70. And so there are these concentric circles of intimacy, it seems, that mattered to him. They certainly mattered to me. To this day, I meet with two guys every other week, and they know me like nobody else knows me. And I think that keeps me accountable. That's a big deal today, accountability, but it never feels quite that way if you're with really good friends. So that matters that they, they know me, they can speak into my life, and those friends need to be um, not yes men. They need to be fearless around you and speak into your life without feeling like they're going to be squashed because you have more authority than they do. So I think it makes a huge difference whether you're accountable, whether your heart is open, and whether they can bear your burdens that you share with them, can pray for you at the deepest levels where very few other people are praying for you because they don't know what you're dealing with. Dr. MacArthur, what would you add about friendship? Well, let me talk about John. <clears throat> uh, I was asked, why would you have John Piper at the conference? And my, my immediate answer was because, one, I love him. Two, he is as formidable um, a lover of Christ as there exists in the world today. Um, three, because he feeds me. I, I don't get a lot of time with John, but I did get thousand pages plus of providence <laughs> delivered to me, delivered to me through your mind and your heart and your faces on every page because I know you 
and I, I, I'm reading, but I'm hearing you, and I know you well enough to know what went on for you to be able to produce such a massive, massive work. I don't know that there's um, more than a handful of people who have had that kind of biblical effect on me of, of modern people. I mean, you probably read more old authors than you do current authors like I do. But for a current author, you, you've delivered your soul to me in so many ways. I remember we were at the Sing conference one year. You might not remember this. And you were speaking at the early session, it was 7.45 or 8 in the morning. I was in the green room when you showed up and you said, what are you doing here? You remember that? <laughs> no. <laughs> but I'm eager to hear. And I said, what do you mean, what am I doing here? You're speaking. You said, you came to hear me speak? I said, of course. I mean, you're processing, you flew from California last night, you got in late at 7 in the morning, which is 4 or 5 in the morning. I, I wait for the Lord to use you to, to, to bring me what I need for my heart and soul. So anytime I can do that, I'm going to be there. Well, you're kind. Uh, you know, um, C.S. Lewis uh, made the distinctions about the four kinds of loves and uh, eros, uh, love, lovers are, are looking at each other in the face and they're telling each other how delicious they are. And, and No, it's and, not that kind of love, John. Don't, don't, don't interrupt. I'm getting there. And, and, and philos is, is friendship, and you're not facing each other. You're facing a, a passionate goal, right? Shoulder to shoulder. And you, you're not doing a lot of intimate talk. I, I started with the intimacy piece of, of those guys know me through and through. But what makes it friendship is the shoulder to shoulder pulling in a worthy, great cause you're willing to die for. And when you smell in another person that you're pulling in the same reins, in the same yoke, then you feel like we could die together. This would be good. This would be good. <laughs> so that, that's, the, that's the kind of friendship you, you want. You want a shoulder to shoulder, common goal, common vision. And, and this might be a good place to say, I don't believe it's a good goal to have a theologically diverse staff. I mean, I've heard pastors say, like, oh, we don't need to agree on, on all the theological things on the staff. I say, baloney, you, you, you got to lead your people together. You got to lead. And so when you're shoulder to shoulder, you know what the other person is thinking, you know what the other person is feeling, and oh, the camaraderie that brings you. So that when the church gets into a crisis, oh my God, Goodness, how glorious is it to have a few close friends that you absolutely know they're going to be standing by you through the, through the crisis. Yeah, that's a great answer. That's why J.C. Ryle said that friendship is that beautiful thing, gift from God, that doubles our joys and halves our sorrows. That's good, yeah. And that's what you men are sharing with us. And that's why pastors need Christ-honoring, Christ-centered Christ pursuing friendships. Yeah, yeah. So let's dig deeper into yeah. that and talk about. Yeah, Can I go say ahead. one more thing? Yeah, you're, it's, it's you the best, Pastor John. Um, if you're really bound together deeply, theologically deeply, spiritually deeply, you don't have to spend a lot of time together. I mean, I've got a few friends, I see them once a year or so. I, I see him less often than that, probably. And when you get together, you just pick up where you were. That's the way it was with those people. For, for years, I've, been, I've related to some people that way. It's like a once-a-year friendship, but it feels deeper than some you, people you see every week because the shoulder-to-shoulder the, the -shoulder common convictions and ground and, and goal is so deep. So don't feel like uh, you can't have significant friendships with people that you, you knew in college or you knew in seminary, but you, you, got, you keep up with them at a distance. You know, I... <clears throat> I had that kind of relationship with R.C. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll we were on opposite coasts, and we spent some time together, maybe once or twice a year, Steve, and, and yet there was this 
shoulder-to-shoulder attitude that we knew if we ever were in a severe battle, we needed to be together, and that's where we were at ECT. <laughs> um, and that kind of defined that relationship. Um, and people said, how could you have such a friendship when you had different theological views on certain things? And, and again, it's right back to exactly what John said. Um, R.C. would always say, when I'm in a foxhole, I'm going to call you. That's good. Let's talk about the flip side of this, or, or maybe the, the deepest and darkest part of friendship, which is when a friend fails us. And we've all had that experience of betrayal, a friend that drifts into error, or a friend that drifts into sin. Uh, maybe you could help the pastors here process what was a common experience for the Apostle Paul, for the Lord Jesus, uh, when friends fail you. When that happens, how do you continue to pour yourself into the lives of people? Uh, how do you ensure that you don't become self-protective, but you continue to mm. invest and pour in and love mm. your friends, uh, even when friends fail? Mm. Talk mm. a little bit about that experience in ministry, mm. Pastor John MacArthur. Well, um, I guess for me, it goes back to our Lord and Judas, or it goes back to Paul and the Demas, um, the best of the best of the best of the best are going to be betrayed. And the more you invest in someone, the more potential they have to devastate you. So you can be gun shy. Um, my dad told me <clears throat> when I was just starting out in ministry, something that you referred to a minute ago, don't make close friends with the people you serve with because you'll find yourself being so terribly disappointed. I usually took my dad's advice. I never took that advice. Be because it was overpowered for me by the experience of Christ, and not just with Judas, but even with Peter. If he was disappointed with Judas, who was a devil, how much more disappointed was he with Peter, who was a true believer? So who am I to expect loyalty from everybody all the time? And we, we know what Paul endured, whether it was John Mark or Demas or whatever, and who knows all the other stories, all in Asia have forsaken me. How can you come to the end of your ministry and say, everybody has forsaken me? How is that even possible? And you're the Apostle Paul, and you're the reason that anybody is even a, a Christian. But you, you have to understand that that goes with the territory. Um, that's part of it. And you, you can't, I mean, you do some inventory on in your own heart. Could I have done something different? But for me, the Lord has always balanced that with many more who are faithful over the long haul. And I, I focus on that and rest in the fact that if it was true of the, of the Apostle Paul and of our Lord, I should probably expect a whole lot more disloyalty than I get. You know, there's an interesting connection uh, that I didn't see until about three years ago in, in the Demas text. Um, in verse 7, I think it's, uh, I've fought the good fight, I've, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me, and not only to me, but to all who have loved, loved, his, loved appearing. his appearing. And two verses later, Demas disappeared in love for the world. And so I think one answer to the question of how you survive Demas is by loving the second coming, which generalized means something like this. This world is one conveyor belt of disappointments. I mean, every day has a disappointment in it. Some situation didn't go the way you want. Somebody lets you down. Life is disappointment. And some of them are awful. Demas probably broke his heart. But he so loved Christ, and he so loved the second coming, and he knew that everything's going to be worked out. It's all going to be okay. So I think having a heavenly mindset, which is the way Jesus told us to deal with slander in Matthew 5, right? When they say all kinds of evil against you falsely, rejoice and be glad. Why? Great is your reward in heaven. 
So how, how do you even function in the midst of slander unless you love heaven, unless you believe in, in the future, the world to come? So that's, that's one piece. And, and another piece I'd say about bet betrayal is um, don't become embittered. Lean into reconciliation possibilities. It might seem absolutely impossible that this relationship could be fixed. This is not going to happen. It's just so ugly. Don't believe that. God does miracles. So the worst betrayal I ever experienced was 1993. Seven-year adultery. Man I'd worked with for 10 years. Devastated the church. 230 people left in those days. I think we had about an attendance of 1,200 in those days. 230 people walk because they didn't like church discipline. And I had dinner with that man 10 years later, and we wept, and we held each other, and I attended his funeral, and I hugged his wife, and we made it okay. It was okay. We're going to be in heaven together, and that's possible, guys. It's really possible. And your job is to believe that and not to be the one who's just sneering and saying, you just get out of my life and you stay out of my life because of what you wrecked in this church or what you wrecked in my relationships. So believe the miracle is possible that reconciliation could happen. You know, building on that, um, building on that, I think you also have to look at that person as an instrument through which the Lord is perfecting you. That's right. Um, th those, are the, those are the best times for your spiritual benefit. Um, they, they tear down your pride and self-confidence and sense of privilege and expected rights. Um, and if you will look at the person that hurt you the most as the instrument that God used, then you'll understand what Paul was talking about when he wrote to the Corinthians about the thorn in the flesh. And the Lord said, I'm not going to remove it because when you're the weakest, you're the strongest. And I think we're ne we never are going to be We're never going to be too weak to be effective. All right. That 2 Corinthians reality of chapter 12 really runs through that whole book, doesn't it? Mm. I mean, may the, may the, that pastoral suffering is for the sake of their people. It's just all through the book. It just starts off in chapter 1. May you be comforted with the comfort with which you have been comforted by God. So if you wonder why you're going through the hell you're going through right now, it's for the sake of your people. God wants to do something in your shepherd heart that will make you a more wise, compassionate, loving, insightful, caring shepherd. You both have battled for truth, various difficult doctrinal controversies, uh, battle for truth in ethical matters like the ones you're addressing where someone drifts into error. Uh, I think you model both of you being warriors for the truth. And this conference is about the truth, triumphing truth. Uh, how do we think about battling for truth and maintaining that full awareness of grace. Another way to say it is, how do we differentiate in our battling for truth between contending and being contentious? How do we be bulldogs and followers of the Lamb? Yeah, that's good. You should be a preacher. <laughs> Sound like H.B. Charles. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I'll give you some more time. So I, 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 lo I love John Owen and I love Machen. And so I, I did this little book years ago on contending for our all. We call it R.C. Sproul wrote the, something for it, our forward or blurb or something. But he liked it. And that made me, that made me feel really good. But Here's the, here's the one quote that made all the difference for me, and, and it's been a goal. I don't know that I've achieved it, but 
Owen said uh, that we should commune with the Lord in the doctrine for which we contend. Mm. Commune with the Lord in the doctrine for which we contend. Now, here's what that means to me. So I'm fighting for justification, say, with N.T. Wright, or I'm fighting with Calvinism against Roger Olson or whatever. And, uh, and I've had, I know these guys, I've communicated with them. It's not like throwing hate bombs over the fence. Uh, my um, desire is that I would be authentic with them and real with them and that I would not be contentious, but when it's, it's justification or the sovereignty of God, as I go into battle, whether it's over lunch or in a book, I'm saying, Lord, I don't want this to be a game. I don't want us to have a little tiff here. I don't want to play word games or doctrine games or proposition games. I want to know the sweetness of justification. I want to know the preciousness of the sovereignty of God. That's the only reason I want to defend this. I don't want to win anything. I'm not out to get strokes or be famous. I want to enjoy you. I think that's what Owen meant. I want to enjoy God in the doctrine for which I contend. I think that changes the spirit from contentiousness to a humble, holy, courageous contending. That's one factor. No, I think that's true. <clears throat> um, that will prevent you from being angry or being hostile because if you love that truth, that basically takes over your heart. So that, that is the first thing, that, that this is a truth you love, not a club with which you want to beat people. The second thing is this is a person that you love or that you care about. So your attitude is going to be the combination of how you feel about the truth and how you feel about the person. And if you lose it on either side, if you're trying to win an argument, you're going to be cantankerous. Or if you're indifferent to the person, you're going to become frustrated with dealing with the person and you're going to lose the tenderness and persuasiveness that the Spirit of God would want you to have while you're trying to convince them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's very helpful. I, I yeah, would please add, keep going. I would yeah. add, um, joy, along with love, has a huge effect because you can lose your joy like that in an argument. Anger becomes anger is is an omnivorous emotion. It eats everything. It eats compassion. It eats joy. It eats everything. If you get taken over by anger, and joy is a great antidote. An antidote. So, so in, in your local church, there'll be little controversies. We're, we're talking, kind of talking big controversies here, public controversies. But in your church, you'll have controversies. People don't like what you just said or believed. So I had a guy one time who, who did not like my eschatology. I won't even tell you which side anybody's on here. But I, I preached on a Sunday evening, went public kind of, and, and I said, I can't imagine anybody wanting to do that. He said, he's at the back of the row, he said, I don't believe that, right out loud in the service. Oh. <laughs> now, here's another illustration of somebody you get really reconciled with. And I said to him, along with the other people sitting like this in the back row, I'm going to outrejoice you and outlive you. And I did. <laughs> but 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 that that particular man, that particular man, that was I was brand new, like three years into my 33-year ministry, and 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 we became precious friends. We never agreed. Precious friends. And 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 when he when he moved away to Iowa later, he called me after about six years. And he said his wife had died, and would I do the funeral? So don't, don't think that the people who stand up and shout out in your service, I agree with you, Pastor. Don't think they, don't, they won't do a 180 and love you like crazy before you're done. 
Because what was under that, and, and one of the reasons we like each other so much is he loved the Bible. He loved the Bible. He thought I was unbiblical. But then after two, three years, <laughs> after two or three years, he said, Piper's not unbiblical. He's, he's totally under this book, and we'll just have to agree to disagree on that one. To think about your ministries and how they will be thought of in the future is beyond our capability as people uh, with our, our limited understanding of how God works and how providence unfolds. But I think it's not speculation to say that though you've written hundreds of books between the two of you, tens of thousands of pages and millions of words, many, many years from now, you both will be known for one book, first and foremost, that you wrote. I think you'll be known for desiring God and you will be known for gospel according to Jesus. Those are formative, definitive, huge impact books that reflect the heartbeat of your ministries and the emphasis of your lives. I would like you to just consider why those books. Especially, I'm interested in, Dr. Piper, are you telling me why is that the case for Dr. MacArthur? And Dr. MacArthur, why do you think that's the case for John Piper? No, that's not what I expected. <laughs> you didn't put that in the notes. <laughs> that's going to be fun. You <laughs> twist. <laughs> Let's go for it. I, I, can, I, can, I can give a, maybe a sort of sophomoric answer <clears throat> to the question regarding John Piper. <clears throat> and I think why that book meant so much to him was his life was revolutionized permanently by Jonathan Edwards. Um, I don't know a John Piper without Jonathan Edwards. I don't... I, I, I mean, this is what comes across to me, and obviously I'm, I'm on the outside looking in. But you can't shake this. I mean, last night you were saying what you said 50 years ago. You can't shake it. And somebody said, what did you think? And I said, it was the best of the best of the best of John Piper. Because it runs so deep, it's in every fiber of his being, and everything in the Bible leads him to that that pleasure. Um, and, and I think God used Jonathan Edwards. I mean, that's all I can say, because the first thing you said last night is, I'm an Edwardian. Um, I mean, by your own confession. And that is, that's amazing with all the opportunities there are for us to be influenced by people. What was the Lord doing when he dropped Jonathan Edwards in you in an irretrievable act mm -hmm. you could never undo mm -hmm. I mean you, you you took Jonathan Edwards I think even beyond where Jonathan Edwards thought he could go mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah I mean the, the awakening the, the awakening to those truths define him in my case um, no that's me I was supposed to say that well, I was, going, I was just going to say, in my case and probably all of our cases, just as a final comment, it took us longer to get on the bandwagon than it did you. Even when you started it early on saying this, this Christian hedonism, I mean, you were, you were double clutching because you knew this sounded weird. <laughs> but, I mean, right here... You, you won us over, John, through these years, and yeah. thank you. Um, was that somewhat true? Everything you just said was true. The last part, I'll wait and see. God. <laughs> well, I'm not. I can't speak for I, I everybody, hope it's true. but I'm. I in. hope it's true. Um, God, God will wait and see. Um, He's already answered 
my half of the question by preaching the sermon you preached two nights ago. This is, this is your theme from 40 years ago with Gospel According to Jesus and the, where's obedience in the church today? And so here's my interpretation of why that took hold of him, gripped him, held him, preaching the same sermon now that he wrote in the book there. And, and I wrote a review of that book. I, was so, I couldn't put that book down. I was so excited with it because of what I was fighting in those days, a kind of easy believism that we both consider then rampant and just as rampant today. Lots of unbelievers in the church. And so what John saw was that in the radical words of Jesus, if you don't love uh, me more than you love mother, father, son, or daughter, you're not worthy of me, period. I mean, that's just totally crazy radical, right? You, you just won't be a Christian if you don't love me. And obedience flows from love. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Lots of people are going to hear the word at the end. They'll be shocked. And, and you, he saw all these radical words, and he looked out at the evangelical church, and he thought, <laughs> do they read the same Bible I read? Do they hear the same gospel? So basically that, that book argued that James 2 is, should be in the Bible. That if, if, if it's, not a, it's not an epistle of straw, if your faith does not transform you into a person who loves other people and produces good works, it isn't saving faith. And therefore, churches need to be confronted with the carnality as dangerous to their souls. And that's, that's what I was dealing with. I, I felt like I've never considered myself to be a very effective evangelist, although I thrill with every story of anybody that gets saved which I heard yesterday from one of you brothers who are in this room right now. Thank you for that encouragement. But I've always felt myself talking to ch the church that doesn't look saved, uh, churches that don't look saved. They, their, their Christianity is so lukewarm, which Jesus is going to spit out of his mouth, that I've wanted to, to do a Christian hedonist kind of revival. And, and you know, the relationship between the two books is this. When you, when you published that, and then I later published book Future Grace and, and What is Saving Faith, I said, all I'm doing is trying to complete what MacArthur is saying. MacArthur said, you must obey in order to have saving faith. And I'm saying, you know why that is, folks? Because saving faith is being satisfied in Jesus, and that changes everything. That's all, that's all it is. I mean, it's just like two, two gloves, two hand and glove fitting together. That's good. That's good. Let's, let's continue to talk about preaching, but more specifically about the act of preaching. And I want you to think about encouraging these brothers in their, the, the grind that is preaching, the continual, ever-present, burdensome joy, it's been called, of preaching the Word of God to the people of God. How has your view of preaching changed since you were a young preacher? How do you think about preaching now? And maybe the question is, why do you still believe, and, and where did this commitment come from in expository preaching after all these years and all these thousands of sermons? Uh, how's your view of preaching changed? Why do you still believe in expository preaching? Dr. MacArthur? Well, that's a simple question because it's the, it's the approach by which you maximize the content of the Bible. If every word of God is pure, um, if there is, and there is, a milk aspect of truth, as Paul talks about, and a meat aspect of truth, that, that means you start somewhere and you keep going deeper. Um, I, I would say now, I probably love expository preaching more than I ever have. And I find it inexhaustible. I, by the time I get to Sunday, um, I could be dangerous so I couldn't preach. <laughs> Do you understand that, John? 
I because like I'm going to bend, I'm gonna bend your ear. I might say to my wife, you might want to go away on Monday if I didn't, <laughs> because you're going to get a sermon. Uh, it, it's the inexhaustibility of Scripture. The, I don't know, how, the, the depth and breadth and height and length, um, the inexhaustible reality of Scripture uh, reveals itself to me every single week. Yeah. Every single week. I've never felt like I've, I feel like somebody on the shore of the Pacific Ocean with a bucket full of water, and you ask me, is that the ocean? <laughs> no. It's just one little tiny part. So um, I could preach, uh, I don't know, endless lifetimes and never exhaust the truth of Scripture. So um, at the same time, expository preaching not only covers everything, but it goes in depth. It, it has to because you, you can't get away with not explaining something. So... Um, I, I love expository preaching. One other thing that comes to mind, and I think about this a lot, is I'm never trying to figure out what I'm going to say on Sunday mm -hmm. because I, I'm progressing through a book and everything is building on everything else. I, I wouldn't know another way to preach, really. Yeah, yeah, you, the short way of saying that is you believe in expository preaching because God wrote a book. Yeah. I mean, just let it sink in. God gave us a book. God gave us a book. <laughs> what would you do? What else would you do but tell people what's in the book? I mean, you don't know anything. God knows everything. He's totally smart. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, it just let it sink in, brothers. If you believe this, this is the word of the creator of the universe. Why would you waste your time talking about anything else? So that's, that's what he just said. <laughs> and um, So the other part of the question, so that's, that's great. The other part of the question about change you know, you're asking two guys who probably more than any other two people on the planet haven't changed anything. We don't change. Um, people ask me, if you, had, you know, what, what have you changed since your theology formed? And I said, yikes, can't think of anything. So, uh, but when regard to preaching, I would say, um, I, th I think if I had to do over again, I was 33 years in the pulpit, I would try to um, be more intentional about combining careful, local, immediate expository explanation of texts with doctrinal formation of the church. I don't think I did that the way I would do it now. I want to do more of this. Now, that's dangerous to say because I know some of you maybe come out of confessional traditions where you start with system and you have to work to be expositionally faithful. And others of you start with expositional immediate faithfulness and you have to work to get to system and doctrine. And somewhere in the middle, I, I want to be because I think churches can listen to us do exposition and, and never form a framework of theology of their own without some help. So that's one change I'd probably make is that I would take, I would, I don't mean uh, necessarily preach uh, theme sermons like you, uh, a whole series on predestination or a whole series on regeneration, but that, that would be great. I would, I would do that. But rather, as you're going through texts and you bump into a word that's just laden with doctrinal content and you don't have to go into that or you can I probably would go into it more now than I would have back in, back in the day. So that's one difference. Um, another is that I, the actual delivery has changed in that I feel much more free to go off script, right? All the time. Like, 
I, I feel the ability to look right into people's eyes while I'm talking. That, that used to throw me for a loop in the first five years of preaching. If I looked at somebody, I'd lose my place. I couldn't, I couldn't think. I think young preachers have a hard time of being immediately, directly engaged with human beings. And, and thirdly, as an older person, I feel more warranted to press into people's consciences, even older people. I mean, a 30-year-old 30, 30 pastor with about 160 old people in his church is a little bit hesitant to get serious with them and, and press into their sins. I don't care anymore. <laughs> that's, that's, one, that's one difference, I think. But in, in, in summary, I think what I've discovered, so this is my, this is my summary of, of preaching that where I, where I land and be happy to die tomorrow and believe this. Um, it's a combination of faithful, rigorous exposition of what's really there mingled with a passionate demonstration or exaltation in the reality of what it's talking about mingled with a in your face application to their consciences. Those three things is what I, I want to do when I preach. It's uh, actually a little easier to do that on the internet. <laughs> it is? Than to face the same people every week and do that. I see. Yeah. So you, 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 you've got to, well, you know what I'm saying. I mean, you got to come back next week, John. You lose some and you win some, right? <laughs> More about preaching, okay? Titus 1, Paul, a servant of God and the apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time. And at his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our savior. Let's encourage these brothers in their preaching and how preaching triumphs. Talk to us about the triumph of preaching. How can you help them see that their, their preaching, which we're able to forget our own sermons in a week's time sometimes. Easy. By Monday. Yeah. But there's something about preaching that's got eternal significance and lasting, persevering power in it. Encourage the brothers that their preaching will triumph. Help them think about triumphant preaching. Mm, mm, mm. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and return not thither, causing it to bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. It will accomplish the thing for which I said it. It's just an absolute glorious promise that God doesn't speak in vain. And the closer you can get to his word, when your word sounds, the more confident you can be, this wasn't wasted. It may look for a moment like it had little effect. It is never without effect. If you're faithful to God's word, so there, there's a promise. I will cause my word to, to accomplish my purposes. That's what I say to myself over and over again when I step into the pulpit. And, and I, I would say this, um, la lasting effect doesn't come from homiletical cleverness, meaning acronyms or like this conference has all P's. How you ever did that? I have no idea. Like 11 P's. Strength, the triumph of the truth through pleasure, the strength of the truth through providence, strength of the truth through prayer. I said, that's cool. How do they do that? <laughs> that has zero effect 
on the lasting nature of these sermons, okay? You just know that. And when you come up with a, and, and you use C's in yours, like compassion, whatever, whatever, that has zero effect on. <laughs> that, that will help you remember his outline about three days, okay? And we're talking about three million years. That's all we care about. And what, what will affect people in three million years in your sermon is whether they were born again and whether the Holy Spirit convicted them of a sin in their lives and they killed it and they walked in holiness until they saw Jesus. In other words, the, the, if, the, the legacy of, of preaching, the lasting effect of preaching is the work of the Holy Spirit. And so you do the best you can with your acronyms, and you do your best you can with stories, and you do your best you can with H.B. Charles' amazing ability to put these little things together that you just say, that's great, how did you do that? And, and you, you do the best you can, and it holds people's attention, and that's good, but in the end, you're talking about what's going to be true in 10 years. And the answer is only if they were born again and if some major mental structures in their life just went 180 degrees. Sovereignty of God, free will of man, regeneration, just massive alterations in their thinking. That's what you're after, and that's, that's the work of the Holy Spirit through a faithful rendering of His, of his Word. Yeah, uh, I think I, I would agree with all that. <clears throat> I would simply say that effective preaching <clears throat> is a journey. You start somewhere and you're going somewhere. And you, you, you illustrated that last night. You told us where you're going to go. And you were going to get us to pleasure. And you, we bought into that. So we followed the journey. The, the, the four points, whatever you call them, the four connections weren't the reality of the message. They were just the progression to get to the main point. So I always think of an outline or any kind of structure as the necessary logical chronology to get you to the main point. And uh, one of the things with preaching is people have to be willing to stay with you till the end because they know that they're going to be given some precious reality if they'll stay. And so I think you handle the Scripture in a progressive way that keeps them involved in that journey. Some of it is the device, the mnemonic devices, or whatever you use. Um, but the, but the uh, preaching is not just shooting out one idea and another idea and another idea and another idea and an emotional thing and a story. It's going somewhere. It's an argument. It's, it's a crafted argument. And it has all the necessary devices to hold them to that. You have to shift and change and pace all of that. But if they'll stay on the journey, if they'll, they'll learn eventually in your preaching that the finish is worth the trip. So stay on the journey. And I think that's what makes your preaching both Pastor John's preaching so similar is it it's driven and logical and focused on the text. And though you sound different when you listen to, as we have our seminarians do, listen to the same passage from John MacArthur and listen to the same passage from John Piper, the central truth is the same. It's the same passage. It's the same meaning because that's what Paul said. But the way you get there, what's common I mean, you move a lot more than he does in the pulpit, but it's driven by logic, right? Both of you are so fastidious and logical and movement oriented towards this is the meaning of the text and how it, it needs to be brought into light and life. So talk a little bit just for a moment about each other's preaching. What, what is it that you see in MacArthur's preaching that is of such preciousness to you? And what do you see, Dr. MacArthur, about John Piper's preaching that you love? I think, I'm not going to say anything that, that we don't all say, is that 
uh, Dr. MacArthur's preaching is incredibly clear. Yeah. It is so clear. Yeah. And it doesn't fumble around to get to the clear point. Yeah. It, as I'm listening, I think he's not wasting any words here. He's not blowing smoke yeah. anywhere. It's just clear. And, and then second thing is, that's really there in the text. That's really there. Look at that. And people love that. I love that. Like, tell me what the text says. I want to know what God says. And, and third, he has the ability to relate the immediacy of the text to doctoral concerns or cultural concerns without getting off on a tangent that gets you bogged down in excessive application, but rather, wow, you, can, you feel the force. That's relevant. Right now, in this situation, that's relevant. So those three things at least strike me and attract me, draw me in. I want to hear clarity. I want to see what's really in the text. I want it to be relevant to my life in this culture right now. And there's, there's just plain earnestness. I think preaching that's not earnest. A lot of pe preachers are playful. They, they think playful. I mean... We, we all know one preacher who crashed and burned a while back, and he said, the main model you should have are stand-up comedians. That's what he said. He said, that should be the main model. You want to learn how to communicate? Watch stand-up comedians. And I thought, <laughs> you, you don't watch many comedians. I oh, know. <laughs> and, and neither do you. I don't. I don't even have a television. No, I, I would say the same about John for, this, for the very same reason. <clears throat> Clarity, the meaning of the text, and the doctoral implications. Um, his, his preaching, I like to think of it this way, his application is one thing, implication is something else. There may be a thousand applications, but there's usually just a few implications that just are so pervasive it changes how you approach life and John is a genius at the implication of a given text without saying this is what you do on Tuesday afternoon when this happens and this happens and this happens it's the, it's the power of that implication drawn because you know the text said it and you understand the bigger picture of the theology that undergirds that specific revelation and that I just, I want to feel the implication. I want to feel the burden of that text. And I want the people to feel that burden. And I don't want to over-define it on a practical level, lest I leave something out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, so what you just heard was not me trying to get them to compliment each other. I'm being serious. This is a good word for young preachers. And you've both poured your life into training men. And... Immature people are drawn to personality instead of truth. And so they, they're of Paul, they're of Cephas, they're of MacArthur, they're of Piper. And what, what that just was was a master class for young preachers to learn what they have to prioritize. Mm -hmm. And it's not style. Mm -hmm. It's substance mm -hmm. and truth and mm -hmm. a focus on the text. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're so grateful for, yeah. for yeah. you men and your yeah. impact in yeah. our lives yeah. because yeah. of that and the model of, of preaching that yeah. that is. Hey, just one caution. Um, as the fact that I love to hear that kind of preaching is, is owing to the fact that I'm born again and have a spiritual taste bud on my tongue. His preaching is going to alienate a lot of people. So is mine. Which means you, you, the fact that we like each other and er, almost everybody in this room likes everybody, right? You know, just, we, this is a nice group to be among. <laughs> but, but you're going to have churches where you preach like he does or like I do, and, and they will not hear it because they don't. They're not attracted to, give me more Bible. I want to hear more Bible. That takes a spiritual mind. So that's why prayer, which HB reminds us of, is absolutely essential. We pray for our people to have ears to hear. Final question. Our culture idolizes 
the young. The Bible reveres the aged. Old age in the Bible is a gift from God. It's a blessing, a tribute of divine favor, a cause for honor, respect, blessing. You both, if I could say it with all the force of what the Bible is saying, are old. Amen. And we love you. We love you old. And 78 and 84. And you are modeling for all of us, if the Lord gives us that many breaths, what it looks like to age in a way that honors Christ. So let's, let's talk about that for just a few more moments here. Uh, talk about aging as a believer and as a pastor. How do you think about growing old in your experience to honor Christ and serve his church? Mm, mm. <clears throat> well, I, I don't know that I, I don't know that I've created a sort of paradigm in which to think about myself. Um, I just do what I do. Um, old age has its issues, like putting on your socks <laughs> and getting a longer shoehorn every year. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't know that I even think about that. I, I'll tell you what I do think about is, Lord, please keep me faithful. Yeah, that's it. Um, I just don't want, I don't want to say something somewhere or um, do something that would undo uh, a lifetime of oh endeavoring don't to be do faithful. That. No. I mean, that's, Lord, just keep me faithful. Um, and I think, I mean, I trust the Holy Spirit. I don't fear. I'm not afraid to live my life. I, I trust the Spirit of God. I, I love the Lord. I love His Word. But I'm not invincible. And the second thing is, Lord, don't let some people say things about me that aren't true, that are destructive because I don't, I don't ever want to be in a position to have to defend myself because that's so impossible. So, yeah, I just pray that the Lord would take heed to myself and my doctrine and, and stay faithful. And Lord, protect me from my enemies who could undo so much if they were believed when they said things that weren't true. Mm, 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 mm. Um, oh my goodness, so many things to say. Um, that prayer, hold me. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. No hope without it. Because if you think sanctification is progressive in the sense that there's no battle after age 70 of walking with Jesus, you're not thinking straight. The danger of the sins of lust at age 78, sloth, doubt, when Paul said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, he meant to the end, right? Till they cut my throat. Because on the way to the gallows, I could betray him. I mean, my, my view of eternal security, which is a Romans 8.30 kind, is it's a community project and is to be fought for. That's the way God keeps you. He keeps you. So I just fully expect that as long as I have a brain, it has to be engaged in keep me, keep me, 
Don't let me do anything stupid to undermine the ministry. Don't let me betray my wife. Don't let me give up on prayer. Don't let me become superficial. Don't let me cave in to just watching videos every night. Oh, God protect me from the world and the worldliness that can creep into a 78-year-old heart. So that's, that's the, the battle piece that I just, I mean, I, I used to think, I don't know if you thought this way, that since pro- sanctification is progressive, that my 30-year-old patients would be 40 years old, more patient, 40 years more patient. <laughs> it didn't work. I mean, I mean, that might be just absolutely self-indicting for me to say that because of progressive sanctification. You, you ought to be a 78-year-old more holy person than at 38, and it doesn't feel quite like that. Like I'm an embattled soul yeah. every day. There's just, these arrows just keep flying, and you've got to be you know, the shield of faith every day, sword of the Spirit every day. So just... If you think you're going to coast someday, you're going to be destroyed because there's no coasting in this life. Now, just to put a a more positive spin on it uh, (laughs) or reality to it, um, first of all, a caution. I know that we are going to get to the point where we can't preach. I mean, would that we could die, right, before we get there. But that's up to God. We don't believe in mercy killing. <laughs> no matter what California or Oregon or Minnesota says, we don't believe in that. So God will decide if we have to, to sit in a nursing home and, and not have all our faculties. That's going to come if we don't die. And, and the question is then, will we be able to be faithful? So don't, don't hear this as a kind of triumphalistic, yeah, strong old people. However, I sat under the ministry of Oswald Sanders at age 89. He was 89, I was 50-something. And he said, I've written a book a year since I was 70. And I just went, yes! Oh, that's what I want to be like. Now my new model is Thomas Sowell, who's 93, right? And when he turned 90, the interviewer asked him, How is it that you've written a book every 18 months since you were 80? So I said, great, life begins at 80. I got two years run up to it, and then we take off. (laughs) So the the way that balances out with the fight is don't don't view aging as so uh, embattled and so beleaguered and so... You know, your body's giving away your eyes. I've got hearing aids on here. I, I mean, it's just everything, this outer nature is wasting away. <laughs> Believe that while you have life, you have ministry. I hate the American view of retirement. I think it's totally unbiblical. I think it destroys souls. Ralph Winter used to say, men in America don't die of old age. They die of retirement meaning they lose heart, they lose meaning. So pastors, you don't have to do like he does and stay in the pastorate forever. You don't have to do that. That's, that's, that's a good thing, that's a good thing. I stopped at age 67, not sure I should have. I don't have total confidence about that, but I've tried to be useful, right? I've tried to be useful from 67 to 78. So all that to say, be, be um, sober-minded about the battle and be hopeful and optimistic and energetic about what God might call you to do between 65 and 85. This Q&A was not brought to you by the AARP. <laughs> I have never responded to one of those 10,000 envelopes. Never. Nor have I. See? We we know that. Yeah, we're we're well aware. So grateful for God's faithfulness 
on display in both of your lives. And this was a very fruitful, profitable hour. Thank you so much, brothers. Okay. You can, you can sit down. Calm down. <laughs> Dr. MacArthur, will you pray for these men and that God would be faithful in their ministries and lives? And sure. Tom, I'll have you come up and, and give some announcements. Father, this has been such a refreshing <clears throat> hour together and in so many ways, our hearts have been warmed and, and even thrilled to feel the impulse of every heart beating in this room about ministry, preaching, and so that they can embrace every, every thought, every answer that we tried to offer, and just it felt like we were giving water to their souls and um, strengthening them, and that's, that's the way it came across, just their exuberant response. So, Lord, we ask that this might be used to raise this generation of pastors, th these men who are right here, to a level of faithfulness and an endurance that will glorify and honor your name. We don't want this to have just been a moment's experience of, as enjoyable as it was, but, but an experience that bears lasting power so that we'll see a difference in the future. So many defectors, so many people who are superficial and shallow in, in their approach to ministry, and we, we need none of that. We need, we need the best and the most dedicated and the most devout and the most faithful and most powerful. So use this, Lord, by your Spirit in the life of everyone who's here to, to make a difference, a notable, significant difference in the next decade and even beyond in the church. For your glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.